Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all here. My name is Angela Hobson, and I am the Associate Dean for Public Health here at the Brown School. And I have the honor of welcoming you all to our second installment of Public Health Speaker Series for this academic year. We have a very timely presentation on the public health crisis of abortion bans. Um, before we introduce our speaker, I just want to say I know we have a number of people here live in our audience and quite a few people joining us online too. So welcome to um, either in person or virtual. Our presentations usually go for about 35 or 40 minutes with um, time for questions and answers at the end. We'll do a round in here. We'll also do our best to accommodate uh, questions that come into the chat for those of you joining us virtually. And um, to, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Colleen McNicholas, uh, our Assistant Dean for Academic Programs is gonna come up and do the introduction. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Ragini Matapati. She is a lecturer here at the Brown School, and she has many years of experience working in clinical research, data management and analysis, program management and evaluation um, around sexual and reproductive health and reproductive justice. She received both her MSW and MPH from the Brown School. She worked for a while in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Washington University School of Medicine and was an integral team member of the Contraceptive, Contraceptive Choice Project and numerous research and clinical initiatives focused on increasing health equity and access to reproductive and contraceptive services in the St. Louis area. Over the last eight years, Ragini has provided supervision and mentorship to public health students, social work students, and School of Medicine students. Um, she serves as an adjunct instructor through the Clinical Research Training Center at WashU School of Medicine, and here she teaches Foundations of Epidemiology. I know a lot of you know her well through that. Um, found that she's taught foundations of field ed, and she also teaches public health seminar, and she's, she was an integral part of the school of medicine team, but she is an integral part of our team here, too, and it's such a joy and pleasure to work with her, and with that, I'm going to have Ragami come up to uh, introduce our, our guest today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Angela, so much for that introduction. I wasn't anticipating that. Uh, <laughs> but just want to say welcome, everybody, to our second installation of Public Health Seminar, those of you here and those of you online. Um, it is my, I'm extremely honored and excited to have this opportunity to introduce our dear, my dear colleague and mentor, Dr. Colleen McNicholas. Dr. McNicholas is a graduate of the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. She went on to complete her residency in obstetrics and gynecology, her fellowship in family planning, and her master's of science in clinical investigation right here at Washington University School of Medicine, which is where I had the pleasure of working with Colleen. She remained on faculty there for six years, achieving the rank of associate professor before joining Planned Parenthood of the St. Louis region and Southwest Missouri as the first ever chief medical officer. In this role, she has worked to expand clinical services to Planned Parenthood's patient population, notably expanding access to PrEP, gender affirming care, and abortion access. <laughs> Dr. McNicholas believes that a physician's advocacy role is as important as their clinical, surgical, and research skills, and I can say, having witnessed this firsthand, that is absolutely true. She has grown into an unapologetic and vocal advocate engaging in every available medium. She has been the plaintiff in numerous challenges of state and federal laws and regulations and has testified in the state capitol and in front of Congress in defense of patient-physician relationship and the importance of using science, public health principles, and evidence in the creation of health policy. She is a member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society and has been recognized by a diversity of organizations for her leadership and advocacy. As I said, it is an honor and a privilege to know you and work with you. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Colleen McNicholas. Okay, I just learned that I have 35 minutes so you guys can ask questions. So I'm gonna talk fast. Um, 
Ryan and I were like baby researchers and baby doctors together. So this is sort of fun um, to come full circle. So um, so thank you for having me. Thank you for that kind introduction, Ragini. Um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time today talking about public health, which arguably many of you are probably much more expert at than I am, talking a lot about abortion. I'm gonna claim that one. I'm probably much more expert at that than you are. Um, but really the intersection of those two spaces um, and that intersection being what I think is a really important critical moment for us in public health as we're looking at this evolving public health crisis that is um, a consequence of abortion bans sweeping the country. I have no relevant disclosures. I do have some research funding. It is unrelated to this topic. Um, and here's your shocker for the day, I am an abortion provider, uh, which obviously influences my opinions about abortion access and the importance of that access to our community. Okay, so let's start like way, way back um, from our earliest civilizations and perhaps without the language or the formal definition, societies across the globe really recognized and worked diligently uh, towards the promotion of health and reduction of disease and what we now call public health. And that started, you know, even as early as the aqueducts in Roman civilization to a little bit later on in the 1800s when hand washing was identified as one of the most important um, changes that physicians can make in their practice to reduce infectious burden. Um, it probably won't surprise you that at that time, physicians were uninterested in that recommendation. Um, and turns out they're still fairly uninterested in that recommendation. Um, and so if you're ever in the hospital when one of the JCO or accrediting bodies are over there, they're always watching us wash our hands because we're not very good at it. But um, just to illustrate the point that there are, um, you know, public health for a long time across all societies has really been something that communities are striving for. And we can think about some of the historical or even more relevant and timely successes that we've had in public health, maybe categorized sort of globally and then looking a little bit more domestically. And this slide is not intended to say that these are the five things I think globally are the most important wins that we've had in the, in the last um, century, but I think it is a good representation of the diversity and the breadth of what public health addresses. And what I'm doing here is setting the stage for why I think public health broadly um, intersects with abortion in even these sort of maybe not so obvious ways. So certainly global health um, wins have, we've seen wins in vaccine preventable diseases, the development, the identification of germ um, theory and the, and, and the development of um, diagnostics and therapeutics to control infectious disease, HIV, HIV prevention across the world certainly has had huge gains um, and safe water and sanitation certainly are right up there at the top. When we look more domestically, some of those things are still on the list, right? Safe water, childhood lead poisoning, some of these we're still struggling with, or we take a couple of steps back every once in a while. But also US and domestic public health wins have been things like motor vehicle safety from the implementation of seatbelt uses or um, regulations around um, car seats for children, occupational safety wins, right? Things like making sure you have closed toes and eye protection when you're working in the factory. And certainly the reduction of disease burden in um, tobacco use have all been things that domestically um, we have seen lots of gains in. So how does the US decide what are the measures and what are the outcomes that we're gonna prioritize in terms of public health? So they use a framework called Healthy People. This is the fifth iteration of Healthy People. Uh, it started in 1979 after the Surgeon General at the time put out their Healthy People, uh, the, the first Healthy People manifesto essentially. And about every decade, we review those public health measures and outcomes um, and come up with a new set or refine the set, prioritize some and put others down lower on the list. So for this decade, there are no fewer than 358 core measures and outcomes uh, that the Department of Health and Human Services are looking to make some, some gains on. And they do divide them by categories or, or constituencies and, and populations. So when we're looking at, and this is again, just to give you a sense of the breadth of the things that the, that the Department of Health is looking at, when we look at all comers, um, one of their top priorities is looking at calorie intake from sugar. Um, we can do a whole nother lecture about how sugar got to be the thing that the 
the FDA and everybody else ignored. Um, it has to do with money and lobbying. Shocking, right? Um, but we are now in a place where we have a public health crisis around the number of calories that are consumed by Americans um, through refined sugar. Healthy air, we all know that drug overdose is a problem right now, increasing the number of folks who are getting flu vaccines. Um, and then there's some other things like really addressing still the very high number of Americans who are uninsured um, and suicide rates. Looking at adolescent or children populations, um, some obvious things on there, reducing infant deaths, um, addressing the rising epidemic of obesity in our children, but also looking at measures like um, how many of our kids are reaching the fourth grade reading level at the appropriate time. And then of course, when we're looking at adult populations, you know, my, my bandwagon here is, of course, maternal mortality, and we're going to talk a whole lot about maternal mortality here in just a little bit, but also looking at things like cancer prevention screenings, the consequences of binge drinking, and what employment, secure employment does to a, a community's public health outcomes. So before we talk about how abortion bans um, and abortion access is a public health crisis, or before I convince you of that, um, let's talk about how we define when we have a public health win. And I'll oh, see the thing is messed up. It was very nicely. Anyways, um, <laughs> so there's no single definition of how public health, uh, what constitutes a public health win. But at the highest level, the most broad um, understanding it's really going to be an intervention that maximizes healthy, thriving years of life. And I added healthy, thriving in here because for a long time, it really was just um, longevity of life. And it really didn't take into effect our people having quality of life in that. And so we really are starting to see a shift in not just sort of longevity of life or life expectancy, but, but looking at sort of the quality of the life that we have. And the way that we're going to do that through a public health lens is through prevention of disease, disability, injury, and premature death. And more and more, we are seeing an appropriate and urgent need to center equity, making sure that whatever interventions that we are um, lifting and executing and implementing, ultimately assessing um, and then revamping, are done with an equity lens to make sure we're really making every effort to close the, the gaps and disparities that um, we have amongst our most marginalized populations. Okay, so that's how we know we're winning. What about how do we know when we're in a crisis? And the truth is, it's a sort of overlay of multiple things. We have a precipitating event or events um, that when you overlay scale of the event or events, preparedness of the system, and timing of the system, if they all culminate in a scenario in which whatever the system is, the infrastructure that is in place to support um, that precipitating event, if that system is overloaded, um, we're now at a point of public health crisis. And I would um, propose to you all that the precipitating event for the public health crisis of abortion access wasn't June 24th in the Dobbs decision. It actually started many, many years ago, uh, really probably around the time of the Casey decision, which allowed for states to start regulating abortion um, under what is known as the undue burden clause meaning that subjectively every abortion regulation or law was left to a judge essentially to decide if that regulation made it hard enough or too hard for some people in that state to access care. Now, before we move on to the sort of abortion nitty gritty, I wanna make an important distinction, especially since I'm standing in the School of Public Health um, to say that healthcare clinicians, so nurses, physicians are not necessarily public health experts. Um, and we saw that nice full front circle with the pandemic when we had physicians out there saying all sorts of crazy things that were not from a public health lens. Um, but we're not trained that way, right? It's a specific lens that takes a thousand steps back and looks at outcomes um, for a population. It understands and accepts that those outcomes that you're looking for, the interventions that you're going to apply, are going to take a long time to see um, some change. That's, again, not how those of us who are trained in medicine are. In fact, those of us who are surgeons, we want it right now. <laughs> um, and if the surgery could be less than an hour, that's even better, right? And so um, it's really a different approach to thinking about healthcare and health more, more broadly. Physicians are trained to diagnose and to cure, um, whereas opposed to the public health lens, again, is really around prevention, promotion, and protection. And I want to lift that, although um, there have been lots of public health wins, um, there aren't many times that, or many examples 
of when we take our eye off the ball, that we can sort of take a thousand steps back in what was once a, a very solid win. And you don't need to look any further than the water crisis that is happening in this country. From even a decade ago, it's almost been a decade since Flint, Michigan's crisis started, um, to even just this month, the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi. You know, we've seen and continue to see public health outcomes from just those little tiny steps back um, in this what once was a success in a variety of different spaces. So in the pregnancy space, um, the uh, the folks in Flint, Michigan have seen increased rates of miscarriage and low birth weight um, deliveries. In the adult population, increasing rates of depression and anxiety, and kids are struggling with things like cognition and behavior disorders, even some hearing um, impairment and delayed puberty, all which has been um, at least associated with, um, I'll be careful, association, right, causation, associated with the, um, the increasing lead in the water and, and subsequent even Legionnaire's disease as a result of, of the crisis. So this for me is an important reminder that although we are in a public health crisis right now as it pertains to abortion access, um, there are other public health wins that sort of took a couple steps back and can and will eventually move forward again. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to abortion and public health. And I'm going to start from, from the global trend and then we'll work our way back down domestically and even locally here in Missouri. So um, globally for the past 50 years, uh, it is unmistakable that the progress has been towards liberalization of abortion access. Um, you know, this is a busy slide with lots of, of countries on there, um, but what you should see is that by and large, the globe is moving towards liberalization. Even in some of the most um, religiously rooted countries, even in the most conservative countries, and the success of this move from either prohibited or very restricted to more liberalized legalization has been rooted in public health arguments. Um, these are countries that still were at least routinely seeing significant maternal morbidity and mortality as a result of unsafe abortion. And so when I spend time with my international colleagues, um, it's actually, it's a very interesting uh, conversation. They don't need to be at all convinced that abortion should be liberalized um, or legalized, or legalized, or what is, you know, made legal. Um, <laughs> Uh, because they continue to see those poor public health outcomes um, for the folks in their community. On the flip side, there are only two countries who have moved towards criminalization, and that would be ours uh, most recently, and um, we are joined in that effort by Nicaragua. So what is the state of the states? Um, and I have updated this map probably about 25 times in the last six weeks, um, and that's because things are moving a lot. Um, this is though, I think, a pretty good representation of where we are now. Um, the bright pink states are those that have total abortion bans in effect. The mauve or lighter pink are those that have some form of abortion, um, but could be fairly restricted. So for example, Georgia is mauve, but it has a six week ban. So very few people can actually access abortion in Georgia. Florida has a 15 week ban. White states are places where you can generally, abortion is generally accessible. Um, and then blue states are those where it's protected. So obviously for us, our clinic in St. Louis, Missouri is no longer providing abortion, but we have a clinic on the other side of the border in Illinois and Fairview Heights, where um, we are now fielding and absorbing um, the many, many folks who are sort of mass mobilizing from the South and the Midwest for abortion care. The two yellow states are states that are actively litigating and truly day by day, um, whether the law is enjoined or not keeps changing. So that's, that's why they're yellow. Um, the light pink and the yellow are expected to also eventually become bright pink as legislatures come back into session. Okay, so what is the magnitude of the impact of this? Um, there are currently 17 states and projected to be up to 26 states who will either fully ban or are expected to severely limit and restrict abortion access. That will impact more than 25 million people of reproductive age and capability. And we've already seen in the last three months that 66 clinics in those uh, bright pink states and some in the lighter pink states have stopped providing services. Um, I could spend 
many hours going through the 385 measure outcome measures that uh, Healthy People 2030 puts out there and walk you through how each one of those is somehow intersecting with abortion. I'll save you that pain, but um, but I am going to pull out some of these to just demonstrate what I think is um, this critical moment that we're in. So, for example, um, availability of prescription medication. You may or may not have heard that lots of folks now who use medications for non-abortion, non-pregnancy related care, medications like methotrexate, for example, to treat things like arthritis, are having real difficulty accessing that life-saving medication because, in other instances, it could be used for abortion care. The same is true for folks who are suffering from miscarriage. They're having real difficulty accessing the medications that we use um, to really reduce the morbidity and mortality related to miscarriage um, because there could be some potential that um, it could also be used for abortion care. So let's start with some of the more obvious ways that abortion and public health intersect. Um, one of the things that folks really like to talk about is the safety of abortion and how um, the moving towards criminalization of, of abortion will move us back to a place where we've increased maternal mortality. And this is sort of a timeline. I will say that, you know, liber although the Roe decision happened in 1973, liberalization of abortion laws really started in the 1950s, um, where we had some states like California and, and New York um, who had liberalized their, their laws to allow for at least some circumstances of abortion. Prior to that, it was really based on British common law, um, where abortion was available when requested um, until the point of quickening or the point that somebody can feel the fetus moving um, in, the, in the uterus. These numbers across the top are raw numbers. So in 1963, based on the best uh, evidence that we have of legal abortions, there were 280 deaths associated with abortion. As we got closer to 1973, there were only 19 deaths associated with legal abortion. And the most current statistics is that we may have one or two a year, um, which translates to a rate of about 0 0.4 deaths related to abortion per 100,000 pregnancies. Now, I will put on the bottom there an, import, uh, an important um, point to, to counteract that. Um, maternal mortality rate in this country is far exceeds the 0 0.4 per 100,000 um, pregnancies. The most recent data suggests that maternal mortality in this country, despite being the wealthiest country with the most advances in all of this fancy medical um, technology, is 24 per 100,000. And when we drill down on the health disparities that exist within maternal mortality, Black maternal mortality is much higher at 55 per 100,000. And there's an important point to be made here around where maternal mortality is the worst. And so this is ranked from 50th down, um, the bottom 10 um, states in our country for maternal mortality. Louisiana leads the pack at 58 per 100,000. Um, Missouri is right up there, right? 35 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And when you look at what the black maternal mortality rate in those states are, is it, it's abysmal, 112 black pregnant folks um, per 100,000 are dying of pregnancy-related causes every year in Louisiana. So the states with the worst maternal mortality rates are also the states that are banning abortion. And this is no surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise. And it's not. Um, it, it, it's pretty consistent with what we know um, about health policy in general in these areas. I don't want to leave out morbidity. So we oftentimes talk about mortality, and that is an incredibly important um, health metric. And in 2020, we had 850 maternal deaths in this country. Um, largely, those are preventable. For every single maternal death, we have at least 70 episodes of serious morbidity. And serious morbidity is defined by the CDC and WHO as requiring a life-saving intervention. That means that 850 times 70 people go home with chronic illness or long-term issues in um, caring for their family and that impact their job security, um, that impact their long-term health. 
And this is also in the setting of data this just this week being released around maternity deserts. Um, and so we are now setting up a situation where we are forcing folks to stay pregnant by eliminating access to abortion. And I would say um, by proxy, oftentimes limiting access to birth control. Many of the places that are providing reliable um, and consistent abortion care are also some of the places in these communities that are the only place to receive um, contraceptive services as well. And so those things are happening in the context of also losing access to basic obstetric care across the country. And again, what you should notice is maternity deserts are also overlaid with places that are severely restricting or totally banning abortion, which puts pregnant folks in these communities at real harm. So despite the fact that it's only been three months since the Dobbs decision, um, there is already some evolving data and some projections and modeling coming out of some really smart folks who are looking at um, the data. So the University of Colorado um, Public Health School put out their analysis of what they're expecting maternal mortality rates to look like in this post-row reality. And by using some um, the estimated number of abortions in places where it is restricted, making some assumptions about how many of those folks would be able to travel, um, and then extrapolating some maternal mortality data, they came to this conclusion that for all comers uh, in the first year post Dobbs, we can expect to see a 13% increase in maternal mortality in this country, and that will increase to um, at least 24% in year two and beyond. And the reason that that is different is because as you saw from the map, not everybody lost access right away. Now, Missouri was the first state um, post decision to implement its trigger ban. Um, and so it was the first state post the decision to, to lose access altogether. When they looked at their same pool of data and refined that, um, looking at specifically black maternal mortality, they saw that in the first year post Dobbs that we could expect to see an 18% increase. That's 18% on top of what is already um, really abysmal rates. Um, and in year two and beyond, close to 40% increase in maternal mortality for black pregnant folks. So taking a step back to that data around mortality related to abortion, um, there are lots of things that contributed to the fall of mortality and the reduction of, of morbidity around abortion um, as it became more available and, and legal. Um, certainly techniques and procedural safety have evolved. Um, by and large, the reduction in mortality and morbidity is driven by access. When people have cl access closer to their home, they access that care sooner and Earlier abortion care is safer abortion care. Um, we did a good job in this country in the last, a reasonable job in this last couple of decades of training providers to be able to, to, be able to provide abortion. Um, and there was a new phenomenon in which abortion was available in hospitals. Um, we are now in a, again, a critical time point where um, abortion access, for example, in this region, there is no hospital access. Um, and so when I need to send somebody for hospital care, I'm sending them to, to Chicago. In 2019, the National Academies of Sciences um, and Engineering put out what I think is the most comprehensive assessment of the safety and quality data around abortion care in the United States. It is a multiple page, great read, you know, with a cup of coffee and a fire, but I'll, I'll give you the cliff notes, um, which is there are three really main things that I think are important to this discussion. Uh, safety, and this was, this came out pre Dobbs. The safety of abortion depends on where you live, right? And that really is 100% driven by, again, access. Abortion restrictions are barriers to care. So it is actually the abortion restrictions themselves that are making abortion care less safe and that abortion is safest earlier in pregnancy. So what's happening in sort of the epidemiology of abortion right now? Well, until the most recent data that just came out, national trends on abortion had been going down. But in the most recent data in 2020, we saw that our first uptick in the rates of abortion um, in this country. 
I have lots of thoughts about why that is, but um, probably the leading driver is uh, the pandemic, like everything else, right? Uh, folks were not working, folks' financial security became um, more tenable, um, and folks were sick, right? Their caregivers, the, the people who were caring for their children might have passed away as a COVID-related um, death. And so um, there was lots of transition in people's public health, lots of fear about what the, the future was looking like. And so it was the first time that we saw upticks in, in abortion for a long time. What didn't change is when people were accessing care. So in 2020, it was still true that the vast majority of people accessed abortion care in the first trimester at less than 13 weeks, 6% at 14 to 20 weeks. And despite the fact that the, the political narrative focuses most of its time on this 21 plus week time, less than 1% of the people who access abortion in this country do so uh, at a time beyond 21 weeks. Now, what have we seen since that time? So I pulled some of our own data from our Illinois clinic and in the three months pre-Dobbs compared to the three months post-Dobbs, we have seen a nearly 200% increase in the cases that we're taking care of in the second trimester. This is happening for a couple of reasons and we'll talk about why. So, um, okay, so I'm showing my age now. If y'all know what this sign is, okay, good, okay. This is what MTV was like a thing, right? Okay, so the real world. So what's, so what's happening on the ground? Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about a patient that we saw um, a couple of weeks ago. From Louisiana, had irregular periods, thought she was probably about 10 weeks when she figured out she was pregnant. She made her appointment in Florida. That was a reasonable drive for her. Florida has a 15 week ban. She got to Florida for her appointment. She was 15 and a half weeks, so she had to go back home. She went back home. She knew from Florida that a 15-week procedure costs more than a 10-week procedure, so she spent a couple of weeks figuring out, waiting for that next paycheck when she would have enough money to make her next appointment. She waited that two weeks until her next paycheck. She called us in Illinois, so at this point, she's 17 weeks. She calls us in Illinois, and now she learns that because of all of the access issues, our wait is three weeks. So now she's not only 17 weeks, now she's gonna be 20 weeks. Her one-day procedure became a two-day procedure. Now she needs a hotel overnight. She needs somebody to watch her kids. So this is how gestational ages are getting pushed further and further. Before the Dobbs decision, we could get people in in two or three days. Now we get people in in two or three weeks. And that's despite many operational changes. We've moved to six days a week, 10 hours a day, and we do Sunday clinic once a month. So we have done many things to try and add slots to the, to the available um, appointments. But despite that, we have seen no change and um, we've not been able to make any headway in reducing that wait time. Training, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I think there, is, there will be significant um, long-term consequences to the fact that hospitals aren't providing abortion care anymore. And that will mainly be in um, having a pool of providers who are trained in the safer techniques. One of the most important um, epidemiologic uh, findings of, of the early time around the road decision was that um, we found out that labor inductions and what was what were called installation abortions um, were not as safe as doing a dilation and evacuation. So we focused our energies on training people to do that. When you don't have a training programs in hospital systems, you lose that pool of provider who are providers who are qualified to do that. We are also creating a pool of providers who will not have the skill set to take care of some emergent obstetric issues. For example, um, historically, and I think probably in the years to come, people who have mid-trimester or middle pregnancy complications historically were treated with a hysterotomy or a hysterectomy. That's a major abdominal surgery. Almost all of those can be treated with a dilation and evacuation from a skilled provider. If you don't have a skilled provider, you are now subjecting women who are having pregnancy complications and obstetric emergencies to hysterectomies, so fertility ending, or hysterotomy, major medical or surgical interventions. And then I will say the most important um, piece in, in my time as an educator on faculty, training residents and medical students um, in abortion care, the main thing I think that we're gonna lose is the opportunity to understand the therapeutics of empathy. Um, it is 
abortion is one of those um, pieces of healthcare that folks come in having an opinion on, and it's very easy to dichotomize your opinion or to understand abortion as a black or white thing. Um, but the truth is that the experience of just sitting with people as they present for that care and tell you their story and, and understand how they're coming to that experience um, is one of the most valuable things I think we can offer medical trainees across specialty. Okay, I'm going to leave some of the obvious here. Let's see. Um, and move to some of the other public health measures that I think intersect with abortion in a really important way. Poverty. Poverty is a public health crisis. Um, and we have long known that life expect expectancy is very much tied to people's income. Um, that has not changed over time, right? We know that folks who uh, live in a household with higher income have much longer life expectancy. So what about abortion patients? So 75% of patients who are seeking abortion are low income. 50% of those are more than 200% below the federal poverty line. More than half of them are parents. And so when you take that financial insecurity and you add on top of that travel and childcare and time off of work and lost wages, we are now facing a impact on labor force, caregivers and turnover in the workforce that have some real consequences. Okay, I'm going to give you another real world here. Um, this patient came from Alabama, um, and she had a chronic medical condition, um, one that she felt was pretty stable. She was living her life, didn't have any um, need for emergent care, didn't feel much different. Um, she had a pretty significant cardiac health history, so significant that it make, made it um, unsafe for us to take care of her in the outpatient setting. So she made her way from Alabama to, um, to Fairview Heights, Illinois, where I evaluated her. I shared with her that I thought it wasn't safe for us to do her procedure, but that we would help her get care in Chicago. So we went through the process of finding the hospital, helping her navigate the logistics of getting to, the, to Chicago. And when all was said and done, she said, I just want to be clear. What you're saying is the only way for me to terminate this pregnancy is to go to Chicago today, and they will do my procedure in two days. I said, yes. She said, okay, I'm going to have to call my work then because I negotiated this one day off and they're going to fire me. And so she was then faced with now the decision of she will continue this pregnancy or she was losing her job. Uh, she went to Chicago for her abortion. Violence. Um, violence has certainly long been a public health crisis um, and in many spheres, inter intimate partner violence, um, and gun violence and all sorts of ways, violence is um, wreaking havoc on our public health in, in communities. It is also the number one, homicide is the number one cause of death in pregnancy. And for folks who experience unintended pregnancy, we know that they are two to four times more likely to experience physical violence. In um, the most recent data, we see that somewhere between 60, 6, 6 and 22% of abortion seekers report that inter, inter or intrapartner violence is the primary reason for their seeking an abortion. And 34% of survivors report that some sort of reproductive coercion as part of the abuse that they suffer at the hands of their abuser. So abortion and violence as a public health issue are inextricably entangled. One more story. Um, this person came from Mississippi. Um, and um, part of the work that we are doing in this post Dobbs world is helping folks navigate the logistics through what we call our regional logistics center. So every patient who is accessing care in Southern Illinois, whether that be with us at Planned Parenthood or the Hope Clinic for Women, which is just a few miles for us, um, gets sort of offered the opportunity to come through the regional logistics center and they get assigned a case manager who helps them figure out how they're getting to us. Do they have food? Do they have somebody to watch their kid? Um, is their car reliable enough to get to us? All of the sort of um, logistics and sort of periphery things that are necessary to get them to us. So this woman um, was scheduled for a flight out of Alabama to St. Louis Airport. Her flight was at 11 o'clock. Um, her case manager received a phone call at 2 in the morning. It's a 24-hour service because weather and all sorts of things. Um, case management, as most of you know, and lots of social workers in the room, it's, you know, it's a never-ending thing. Two in the morning, she called her caseworker and said, can you readjust my ride share to get me to the airport now? And she said, ma'am, it is two in the morning and your flight is at 11. And she said, I know, but he's gone and I'm safe. And now is my chance. So she readjusted her 
um, her ride share to the airport. The patient got to us just fine, had a totally uncomplicated abortion, went back to her hotel awaiting her nighttime flight. When she called her um, case manager again and with tears um, said, I'm sorry, Miss so-and-so, I'm not gonna get on that plane. And she said, okay, are you doing okay? Um, are you sick? Is something wrong? And she said, no, I'm not going home. This is my chance. I have nothing in my pockets, only the clothes on my back, but this is my opportunity to leave that situation. So abortion and violence and public health are inextricably tied. There's actually more than anecdote. Um, and so the Turnaway study, which many of you have probably heard about, is a study that followed a thousand women across 21 states over 10 years um, and followed differences in outcomes based on whether they were able to access their abortion or whether they were denied an abortion. And the reasons they were denied an abortion were varied. Um, largely, it had to do with um, restrictions in their state. So they were too far along, for example, for an abortion in their state, and they couldn't manage to get out for an abortion somewhere else. But it validates all of the anecdotal experience and patient stories that I've been sharing with you today. Um, there, folks who were denied an abortion had 10 years later had increased household poverty, difficulty paying for basic needs, lower credit scores, higher debt. So really had significant impacts in their economic and financial security. In terms of health outcomes, um, they were more likely to su suffer life-threatening complications. In the cohort of 1,000 women, two women who were denied an abortion died during childbirth. Nobody died during their abortion. And they were more likely to have chronic medical conditions um, 10 years out. They reported increased um, rates of intimate partner violence um, and were more likely to be raising their children alone without support from their partner or their family. And obviously, this has impacts on the family unit as a whole. Um, existing children showed some um, signs of slow development, um, cognition, and uh, folks who were denied an abortion reported um, effects such as poor maternal bonding. This, there have been more than 50 publications out of this study, and there is also a consolidated version of the findings in a book. So again, pull up a chair next to the fire with a cup of coffee a bourbon, perhaps. Um, it's a good read and helps to predict what we're going to see here in the coming years. Okay, I'm going to end with um, my favorite and least obvious, which is the impact of transportation safety and abortion access. Um, as I said, we have seen folks, we are fielding um, the folks coming from states all around, um, folks driving hundreds and hundreds of miles, many hours to access this care. Um, and um, in the in the three months pre Dobbs decision, um, the number of folks, the proportion of folks that we were seeing from outside of the bi-state area, so outside of Illinois and Missouri, represented about 4% of the total population of patients we were seeing. Since that time, they represent 46%. Um, and so nearly half of all the patients that we're seeing right now are coming from outside of Missouri and Illinois and, and seek of safe abortion care. So what does this have to do with transportation safety? Well, um, the number of folks that I see who, for example, are coming from Texas. So let's see, Texas. So middle of Texas, 838 miles, 14 hours. That get in their car at one in the morning. They drive 14 hours to, to the Planned Parenthood. They have their abortion. They get right back in the car and they drive 14 hours home. So that human has now been awake for 30 something hours. And despite being offered, again, resources from us and other abortion funds and practical support organizations for things like hotels, the thing that is driving the decision to come to and from in this sort of way is family or work. They have kids that somebody can watch for this amount of time. They were able to negotiate this many days off of work. And so folks are getting back in their cars um, and sleepy driving um, all the way back to Texas uh, after their healthcare um, interaction. So I think I did a good job, 1245. Okay, so 
obviously, I don't need to convince you all that public health is, you know, that transportation safety is a public health issue and stable employment is a public health issue, chronic disease, violence prevention, cancer diagnosis, shared decision making, environmental exposures, health technology. We didn't even talk about technology, but the utilization of telehealth, for example, in abortion care, revolutionary can make a huge difference. Health equity, economic stability, maternal mortality. These are all clearly public health issues. And that's why abortion access is also a public health issue. And, and really, we are staring down um, a public health crisis right now. So thank you. I'm happy to take some questions. There we go. Working. Thank you so much, Dr. McNicholas. We'll do questions now. I really appreciated that very thought-provoking presentation. And I, what I really appreciate is we talk a lot about understanding the data, but also understanding the people behind that data and the lived experience. So thank you for sharing those stories with us. Um, so we'll take some questions now. Um, maybe do we have any in the chat, Jonesy, or none in the chat. So we'll go ahead and, and those in our live audience. And we'll um, see Ellen in the back and then Louisa. And then um, just make sure that you have a microphone before uh, asking your question. Hi, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Ellen, I come from Malawi. <laughs> and I just wanted to find out if you have any information regarding unsafe abortion, because usually when people don't have access, mm -hmm. they resort to other ways of trying to terminate at least from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to understand in terms of the US, um, what's the situation like? Thank you, Ellen. That's a great question. The question was around unsafe abortion. And um, you are right that globally, maternal mortality as it relates to availability or access to abortion is largely driven by um, unsafe abortion techniques. This country, I think, will be in a different position. Um, the availability of medication abortion and um, the willingness of some entities to push some boundaries around medication abortion. For example, um, there's an organization called Aid Access, which is actually an international organization that mails medication abortion to folks wherever they are. Um, so I think um, that the availability and the knowledge of how to use medication abortion um, at home will be one way that this country can, I think, stave off some of that unsafe abortion um, rise in maternal morbidity and mortality. Having said that, that won't be true for everybody, right? So not everybody, you know, even in, in this country has access to technology that or can find aid access, for example. Um, and so I think we will see some of that. I don't think that we will return to the pre-row time where folks were presenting um, to emergency rooms having, you know, self-instrumented, for example, um, in a way that I think that is still really, um, truly a global health problem. Thank you, Dr. McNicholas. Um, to follow up on your point about um, medication abortion, what do you think a public health strategy focused on medication abortion could look like? Um, does it look like early detection of pregnancy and then feeding into some sort of streamlined mechanism to get those, um, those pills that are needed? Um, and then secondly, if you will allow, destigmatization de campaigns. Do those have a part in pushing this political agenda forward? I think there's a sense that abortion is rare, but the research shows that one in five to one in three women of reproductive years will have access to abortion mm -hmm. along all sides of the political spectrum. So is destigmatization really the missing piece? Um, that's that's maybe we're not looking there. Yes, thank you. I'll take the second question first. Um, abortion is not rare, it's common. Uh, it's very common. Um, in fact, one of the things I often say um, in discussions around uh, the prevalence of abortion is that everybody knows somebody or loves somebody who's had an abortion. And if you don't think that that's true, it's because people don't feel like you're a safe person to tell. Um, and so, um, yes, stigma is a big problem. Um, I see it every day. Um, but I will tell you that I also struggle with this as the potential solution. Um, 
because we don't ask people to talk about their colonoscopies or the need for having breast cancer screening or the hysterectomy that they had in defense of, of getting that healthcare service. And so I think there's a fine line um, to walk around empowering people who are willing and ready to share their stories um, and demanding that that be sort of the, the crutch that we are we are sort of relying on to make progress. Does that make sense? Medication abortion. Uh, tell me what was the question about medication abortion? Oh, public health, yes, okay. So um, lots of policy changes can happen around medication abortion to make it more available. So mifepristone and mesoprostol are FDA regulated drugs. The federal government directs what happens to federally uh, approved medications. So. I think there's some opportunity for the federal government to make some changes in how mifepristone and mesoprostol are available in states that abortion is otherwise um, severely restricted or, um, or banned. Um, we have been doing a lot of work with the FDA to pull back some of the regulations around medication abortion. Um, and then I would say the third piece is around um, liberalization of telehealth services. So um, anti-abortion extremists have been really good at attacking individual lines of access and telehealth is one of those. Um, so in other areas of healthcare, we have really jumped into and embraced telehealth as a way to provide higher level services for all sorts of healthcare. I mean, we treat people's strokes remotely via telehealth. There's no reason we shouldn't be able to treat somebody's medication abortion via telehealth. And so I think, um, again, looking towards federal policy to make some, um, some bold moves and um, to tell the states what it is that, from a federal standpoint, what they expect for access to, to telehealth. Angela, can we take one from, the, from Zoom? Great. Um, we have somebody that's asking if you would please explain about lack of access to abortion and food insecurity. Sure. So um, it is not uncommon. So as I, I said, one of the, you know, there aren't many sort of like really great things I could share about doing abortion care in Missouri for the last 10 years. But um, one of the things I can say is that it really did prepare us for this moment. Um, for those of us who've been practicing in places like Missouri, we knew this was coming, right? And in fact, the initial Dobbs case that went to the Supreme Court was really only an ask on the 15-week abortion ban. So Mississippi had a law that would prevent, um, the Dobbs case was initially just a 15 week abortion ban. In the waning hours of the previous president's administration, when a new justice was named to the Supreme Court, the state went back to the Supreme Court and said, wait a minute, just kidding. We want you to actually consider the Roe and Casey decisions, right? I forgot the question. Uh, abortion <laughs> and food insecurity. Food insecurity, okay, that's right. Okay, so, um, so we were preparing for this moment and really, our main effort was around standing up this regional logistics center where we are um, helping folks navigate. So we did think about transportation. We did think about um, housing. The things that we learned in the first couple of months after opening the regional logistics center that people needed help with was childcare. So we revamped a clinic space, one of our education rooms to be a, um, a family room where it has chalkboards and games and diapers and um, where folks can bring their kids with them and have, especially if they're having medication abortion, just have that entire visit in the family room. And the second thing that we learned was food. They needed money for food. Um, so we could get them on a plane and we can get them a ride share and we got them to the hotel and then they had nothing to eat for two days. Um, and so um, I think the intersection of food insecurity and abortion really rests in the consequences of poverty and financial insecurity more broadly. Um, and the fact that, you know, most folks who are 60% of people who are, are seeking abortion are already parents and, um, and some of the real consistent themes over time that come out about why folks choose abortion is the ability to care for the kids they already have um, and um, just global financial insecurity. So. Thank you. We've got one here. I actually have three, but I'm only going to ask one. Um, I'll hang around for a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for coming to us today. My name is Brianna. And I'm actually from Chicago. So it was a really big transition of seeing like those political actions happen in Chicago where most people do not care versus Missouri and being so strict, uh, restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, my first question actually regarded your slide, uh, number 27. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, so between, so that was the one with the graph. Um, between 1973 mm -hmm. and 79, that huge increase, was that because of what you said earlier about the surge in general? Um, and then once you answer that, could you tell me like what changed for it to become stable or constant and then that little decrease? So the, the uptick in 73 was the moving of people from illegal abortion to legal abortion. So it was the folks, so hundreds of thousands of people were having illegal abortions and we weren't capturing those, right? So once Roe became, um, uh, once there was federal protection for abortion, mm -hmm. now we had a way to capture those. People were getting care in the healthcare system. And so, you know, we went from a situation where California and, and New York were the only states where it was legal. And so the only states who were reporting abortion rates to a, a, a situation where now all 50 states had access to abortion. And so reporting went up because people moved back into the healthcare space. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense, yes. Um, the flattening out and the, the decline in abortion rates um, outside of this most recent data point um, are largely driven by increased access to birth control, um, which is going to be a driver of changes in abortion rates moving forward. As I said, many of the providers of abortion care are also their communities reliable location for um, contraceptives. Now for Planned Parenthood clinics in states where um, abortion is now banned, we generally have a diversified enough service line, meaning we provide enough different kinds of services that loss of abortion access isn't going to close down a Planned Parenthood in, in Georgia, for example probably. But if you are an independent clinic who provides sexual and reproductive health care, abortion and contraception, and now you lost that ability, you are likely not to survive. The business model is not going to allow you to survive. So that community now not only loses abortion access, but it also lost its contraceptive provision. Yeah. And I will tell you, I went from Chicago, from the south side of Chicago to Kirksville, Missouri. So if you think you were shocked. <laughs> The south side. I what, what, what was your neighborhood like? Where did you? I live right by Midway Airport. Like oh, Midway. Yeah, yeah. That's like, I went to USL Institute, which is like huh? yes, I there. Look at what you're doing here. Um, am I able to ask another question or? I'll hang around for a few minutes. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas, uh, for giving us such an insightful presentation. Uh, so I have a one doubt, you know, uh, we have been talking about the uh, cutoff for abortion in you know, like 15 weeks. So my uh, doubt is not towards clinical side. Suppose uh, if someone has the history of uh, neural tube defects, you know, and uh, if, uh, uh, if we want to do the new synthesis or something like that, so usually it's done on 12 week, but in most cases like 15 to 20 weeks. So if there is a history, we can go for 12 weeks, but if there is no history, usually we'll go for like 15 to 20 weeks. And if there is, uh, like if we detect any uh, neurotic defects after 15 weeks, what is the procedure? Like, will they allow for the abortion? Like, you know? This is a good question. So, um, Fetal anomalies. Um, so neural to, you, you talked about neural tube defect and, and also use of amniocentesis. Sometimes you could do it earlier, um, but just some anatomic defects, right? Like you don't see them until 20 weeks or so, right? And so this leaves a population of folks who have catastrophic pregnancy findings um, that then we need to figure out how to help. Um, there are most of the states who have completely banned abortion have done so without exception, meaning without rape, incest, fetal anomaly exceptions. And so those folks, like folks who are seeking abortion for economic reasons or familial reasons, have to find a way to do that um, in another state. There are some exceptions um, really under federal protection and TALA laws, so emergency sort of emergency medical care laws um, that are guided by the federal government that says if a person's life is in danger, um, then the federal government protects the physician in providing that abortion care. However, what constitutes a medical emergency is subjective. And I would posture that if you live in a state like Missouri, where the attorney general has natural jurisdiction over all abortion cases, meaning it doesn't matter if Wesley Bell says he's not going to prosecute 
abortion cases, it doesn't matter because the attorney general is the one who gets to decide, then I, as a physician, am going to be really hesitant in what I decide is a medical emergency or not, right? And so it will most certainly cause delays in care um, and unnecessary and preventable mor morbidity and mortality. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think we are right at time. Let's um, give Dr. McNichols one more round of applause and thank you. Thank you. Not only for her time here, but her work in the community and um, advocating for important services for uh, populations here and, and elsewhere. And we really thank you for taking the time out of your really busy schedule to come share thank your you. expertise with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I don't know how to get this off.